Please join me in the prayer for illumination. Gracious God, as we turn to your word for us, may your spirit rest upon us. Help us to be steadfast in our hearing, in our speaking, in our believing, and in our living. May this sharing of your word draw us into an ever-deepening relationship with each other and with you. Amen. Today's reading is from, scripture reading is from Luke chapter 4, verses 14 to 21. Then Jesus, filled with the power of the Spirit, returned to Galilee, and a report about him spread through all the surrounding country. He began to teach in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. When he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release of the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And Jesus rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. The eyes of all the synagogue were fixed on him. Then he began to say to them, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Thanks for the word of the Lord. The Spirit came upon Jesus and revealed his mission. To turn the world upside down by bringing liberation, restoration, healing, and justice to those in need. According to Luke, in the synagogue in his hometown over 2,000 years ago, Jesus declared that the good news was fulfilled in the hearing of the gathered community. In the first of Jesus' sermons, as recorded in Luke, he declared that he was the fulfillment of what Isaiah had foretold, and that by revealing his identity to them, the scriptures were fulfilled in their hearing. And for this to be so, the community had to gather so they could hear the Torah passage being read. Today, Jesus commissions us to keep fulfilling on this good news message. This means that the church, the body of Christ, is crucial to Jesus' mission being fulfilled on earth. The body of Christ, all of us together, are inheritors of Jesus' legacy of justice-making, and it is up to us who, like Jesus, have been empowered by the Spirit to set captives free, restore sight, and be good news for the poor. This text is a call for economic justice and for emancipation from slavery and imprisonment. It is a call for justice and healing for all those who are held captive in some way, are excluded, or are vulnerable. After Jesus reads from the Torah scroll, he declares that the scripture has been fulfilled in the hearing of the community. And yet, so much has transpired in the centuries that have elapsed since that moment. People still need liberation. They still need healing and justice in this time between the now and the not yet. And therefore, the scripture needs to keep being fulfilled in our hearing over and over again. Until Jesus comes again, we have this mission, if we choose 
to accept it. And I propose this morning that one specific way that we can live out the good news that Jesus reveals And the good news that Jesus entrusts to us is this. We can become active supporters of mental health recovery. I believe that God wants us to accept our mission to bring liberation, restoration, healing, justice to all those who are in need. And I believe that those who are directly impacted by mental illness in all its forms are in need of this kind of upside down liberating good news. Specifically, I believe the church, the body of Christ, is called to actively support and companion those recovering from mental illness. Now, I believe this so strongly that several years ago, a colleague and I helped to start a ministry in Vancouver called Sanctuary Mental Health Ministries. We had both worked in mental health for years, and we both had loved ones with direct lived experience of mental illness. And so we were committed, invested, and in talking with clients over the years, we had become convicted of two things. Community and spirituality were important for many people in recovery. People people were healed when they felt loved, accepted, and connected, and when they had a sense of their own purpose and of the something more. And for many of them, that something more was God. Sanctuary's initial mission was to come alongside the church communities in our area to provide training and education and to help build their capacity to support people well. We tried to help communities of faith to form action groups of lay leaders who would commit to transforming their church's culture in terms of how it responds to mental illness. And one of our primary tasks was to help decrease stigma. At one point in time, the term described a physical mark or a defect of some kind. But now, stigma in our society refers to the experience of being perceived negatively or set apart from others due to stereotyping. Some people who live with a mental illness hide out in church, afraid to say anything about their journey. They fear being ostracized or judged. They can feel vulnerable and sometimes prefer to pretend that everything is okay, or at least manageable, rather than take the risk of disclosure. They worry that they will not be met by love. And in many cases, that's understandable. And it's also the power of stigma. And so before we could really begin to help churches become a sanctuary, We had to help them challenge the stigma and the fear that is associated with mental illness. And so we routinely made two statements to begin to challenge stigma. The first, one in five Canadians will have a direct experience of mental illness at some point. That statistic was current in 2011 when we began. But according to St. John's Ambulance, who now offers mental health first aid training, that statistic has changed to one in three. This means that one in three people in this sanctuary this morning will at some point have a direct experience of mental illness. 
And if we take into consideration his family members and friends, it becomes easy to see that mental illness affects a significant percentage of the population. And the second statement is this. We are all on a continuum of mental health. At various times in our lives, we move along that continuum from wellness to illness and back again in response to a variety of factors in our lives. These two statements taken together tell us that episodes of mental illness are far more common than it might seem, given the reticence that many of us have to talk about it openly. They also tell us what our new creed has asserted for decades. We are not alone. Despite the prevalence of mental illness, the journey to recovery can often feel lonely. Church communities like ours are unique, uniquely poised to address this problem. Imagine if all our congregations in the whole United Church of Canada, from coast to coast to coast, were safe, welcoming, and extravagantly loving towards all people recovering from some form of mental illness. Indeed, towards everyone who feels vulnerable or feels like they are on the outside looking in. I acknowledge that our denomination is well known for seeking justice for those in need. And I also think that here at OUC, we already have some idea of what that would be like. Because we are already living into this call to love deeply. I see the support that you offer one another quite organically, and I am often moved both by your courage and your compassion. And when it comes to loving those in our church and in our neighborhood who live with mental illness, we still have many paths open to us. We could make a commitment to getting more educated about mental illness, the various types, the impact, the challenge of stigma, and the pathways to recovery. We could talk more openly about our own experiences of struggling with our mental health and with our well-being, so as to help normalize the struggle and to encourage others in their recovery. We could be intentional about addressing stigma in our own lives and in our community. We could get skills training, like mental health first aid or suicide assessment training, so as to be better able to keep our community and ourselves safe when that is what's needed. We could partner with a mental health agency such as the Canadian Mental Health Association to create structures of support and caring in the wider neighborhood. The options are many and varied. My friends, the church is called to actively support those living with and recovering from mental illness because we are called to love one another as Jesus loved us. As the body of Christ, we are called to bring liberation where there is captivity and to love those who are vulnerable. We are called to fulfill on the scripture and to be the good news to those who need to hear it the most. And the good news is this. The Spirit of God is upon us and empowers us to respond well to those living with a mental illness. God loves us and empowers us to be more like Christ every day. And that means we can bring freedom 
by extending friendship. We can bring hope by listening and caring and praying. There's so much that a church community, our church community, can do to companion the recovery journey. And I pray that the church, our church, in its hearing and in its responding, fulfills on God's promises of liberation, restoration, healing, and justice for those recovering from mental illness. And the good news is also this. God loves you in all of this. You might feel broken. You might feel wounded. You might not feel like you can quite believe the promise of God's liberation and healing. The shame and the fear of being stigmatized might keep you from speaking up, showing up, or asking for support for yourself or your loved one. Please don't let it. Because you are also blessed and loved without measure. And I pray that today, the good news of God's liberating love and justice is fulfilled in your hearing. Amen.